Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a nutritious lunch with a lot of whole foods. That's what's good for the brain, because this is a very brainy panel I have with me, which is why I hope you're ready. We're going to be discussing how to build a resilient data infrastructure, modern strategies for scalable AI utilization. I think they managed to squeeze in every, every good word words. into yeah. that good title. Uh, but how about we start off with a little uh, introductions for everybody, for people that don't know these esteemed panelists. Let's start off. Yeah, myself, John. I'm uh, part of uh, Volvo Cars, uh, their data platform, and we are trying to implement something on uh, data mesh, and we are leading. Thanks. Olof Granberg, uh, independent consultant, worked many years within retail, telco, as a uh, data leader, data architect, data engineer back in the day. Uh, Daniel Tidström, um, senior partner and consultant at DataEdge. Uh, previously spent sort of my career back and forth building data platforms uh, from SQL servers in the early 2000s to Hadoop uh, platforms and now cloud infrastructure. So, uh, yeah. Hadoop has come and gone, hasn't it? Yeah, it's hot in now. In a manner of speaking. Mm. It's coming back. Oh yeah? yeah There's yeah. a little Hadoop here <laughs> and there? I mean, uh, I guess you can think of uh, resilience, if we just focus on that word for just a moment, from a semantic perspective or from just like an infrastructure perspective. And you know, we, we've had all this tooling for being able to do scalable stuff. Sometimes it's easier in the cloud and if you want to do it on-prem, you need Hadoop and some other stuff like that. But I guess I'm, I'll let you guys decide which one you think is more fun. The other side of resilience that I tend to think of is sustainable development practices. Like, uh, can you handle getting more tickets? Can you handle getting change requests without everything blowing up? Can you, you know, like more like workflow um, resilience? Yep. Um, which one of those two is uh, more difficult to get right? How about we start off with that one? What do you say? I think it's the workflow one is more hard. But if it's infrastructure, probably if you just try to keep some of the basic principle, like the yeah, your infrastructure should be basically modular, that if you can make changes really fast, then probably to some extent resilience would be a bit easier, I would mm -hmm. say. Yep. Mm -hmm. I feel like engineering problems, you can always out-engineer. Oh, yes. You know, when people are like, oh, there's a technical challenge. If it's an engineering, you know, engineering pro people will solve that stuff. The, the, but the issue you come up with is when you over-engineer your development process. Yeah, yeah. And spend just too much time making it super complex. And I think that that's part of the, uh, for me, part of the resilience is on that dimension, on, on the development, is keeping it simple enough so that it's modifiable hmm. and so that you build it for future change because stuff will change over time. Okay, but let's discuss that then, what the sweet spot is, because on the stage, I, I just sort of had a flash when somebody on stage was saying, giving an example of uh, an LLM uh, that had filled in product descriptions, and so it just became uh, garbage. And uh, he was like, you see, uh, this is why we need to have data governance. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Who does that? What a garbage mistake. You don't... Okay, so now we have to go buy a data governance platform and have a steering committee and a whole bunch of stuff. And I just get the sense that it's like it, it's not that advanced, but maybe it should be. I don't know. But I mean, w w w how do you hit the sweet, sweet spot? Is that the problem? Do we need more data governance? Do we need the more, but, more? But, but I think I, I mean I, I always want to like see the, the data platform is there for a purpose. It's supposed to handle and manage and enable the business to run certain workloads. And depending on the workload, you need X percent data governance. I mean, if you do. Uh, Financial report, reporting as a bank, you need to have data governance. If you're doing uh, exploratory analysis of user journeys uh, for marketing, you might not need as much data governance. And also connecting it to, I guess, the rate of change in the, in the source data coming in as well. So I guess you need to adapt, but really think about how much governance do we really need for this case. There is not like, to me, having a one, one size fits all solution to have maximum governance on everything, that's just gonna kill speed. Right. What's your experience with yeah, that? Yeah, it's, it's quite similar. The, now the talk is more about like, what is the fine line between data democratization, uh, democratization and 
data governance. So there is no really fine line, or there is, you can't really draw a line there. It's up to the project, it's up to the use cases. We have to really find, but at the end of the day, you want to expose data to do these analytics. And if, so what you could do is like, try to make sure you give the data that this is really have a lot of yeah, information or uh, so on, so that data scientists can do or data analysts can do their work. Also probably it's, it's worth to just uh, discuss more on explainable AI also, so that end user understands like how the model really gets into this kind of uh, uh, decision. Right, right. I mean, um, there, is, there is a sense in which um, if you can express something as a set of rules, it is often very, fairly simple to automate it. Yep. Isn't it so that the difficulty of governance and all this kind of stuff in general is that we've never taken the time to think about the rules maybe even? Or, or maybe that it's hard to even formulate the rules to begin with if it at, is at all possible? Uh yeah, and I think that that is uh, that's a question I spent many years mm. uh, handling, and I, and I think we you thought about it in the in the context of regulation, which you know a lot about as well. Yeah, I mean both in regulation, but also and yeah, a lot of the data governance actually comes back to, to regulations, mm. especially if we're talking data protection side of data governance. Uh, uh, and I think there it's extremely common that you end up with ha needing experts that come in and say every time, oh, this is the use case, then you're allowed to, to do this and this and this, rather than having that expressed somewhere and yeah. saying if it's this type of data, this is what we have in our, in our customer agreements, this is what the, uh, the different regulations say. And I think that you, there is always a risk that you end up centralizing that data governance decision making to a team of experts. And that's really, really slow and right. really uh, cumbersome. And I think the, the, I, the best part there is to really have those experts be support and facilitators mm. and then federate out the responsibility to the business domains. Yeah, I think that I just want to add that that's a key, key thing that you, I mean, you should always ask like, how much of data governance should be on the data platform side versus really an organizational thing. I mean, uh, data platform is just one component. Data is a uh, sort of entity uh, that is produced and consumed across yeah. many teams in an enterprise. Just to add to that, like, yeah, the, I really like the new terms like federated computational governance, which is like, yeah, do as much of, or just push as much of, of governance to the domain teams, as well as try to make it more computational, like have more automation to these rules and these kind of guidelines and uh, policies, as well as, uh, yeah, the central team need to just coordinate, or governance team needs to be coordinating all these federated things. Um, let's talk a little bit about the tech, <clears throat> building a resilient uh, data infrastructure. Uh, in terms of uh, failures, Failures are fun. Where do you see uh, a lot of weakness in the way setups are done today? And I'm not talking about you know, common failure modes of LLMs or whatnot. I mean, I, I, I call these things experiments. You design an experiment, you, you design the success criteria, you design sort of the premises that, or assumptions that are required, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I tend to think of it like a scientific experiment. What, what are common sort of failure modes of, of these experiments that we're running? These, Quality data. AI products, huh? Quality of data, for sure. Quality of data. Okay, let's take a little poll here, just uh, in a few words. Okay, we have quality of data. What do you think is uh, I, common oh, failure area? A common failure, I see, is overcomplicating things. Okay, over-engineering. So, okay, uh, bad or insufficient or any, any special kind of, or just not the right data? Or do you want to refine or you just leave it at data? Um, it's not the, like, yeah, we need to understand, like, what this particular data constitute of. Is it something, the right data I'm looking for? Okay, the yeah. data relevance, let's exactly. just say then. Okay, so we have data relevance, and uh, you, what was yours? Um... I, I, I wouldn't say necessarily over-engineering, but, over, but just making things complicated. Okay, so, because it's uh, time consuming or? Yes, mainly, and, and, and I mean, in, 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 some, in some cases it can be that you're spending 
too many data layers or your some of the data layers has to be super modeled by some really really extreme type of modeling right and, and, and you just spend so much time on that rather than actually getting to the business goal okay at the okay end. I really like that one and uh, what would you say is uh, what's uh... I, I would say that a common failure that I, I see and that many companies I guess are in is that they I don't know if it's maybe over-engineering, but sort of overemphasizing that they're building something that will last because it will not. Yeah. Uh, the rate of change is so quick, you need to think thoroughly and build it to change it. Yeah. And I think that was one key learning like in, in, the, in the Hadoop era where there were like yeah. new open source packages that changed everything coming out every month. Mm. So you sort of have had to work with abstractions and modularizations yeah. and interoperability. But how do we do and that? I think if, it sort of holds bank, true still. The bank uh, wants you to have you know, an architecture and a plan that is two years long for your generative AI platform. Yeah. I, I think it's, uh, I don't think you should do it like that. You, no. you should, okay. uh, I, I think it's better to like, sort of what kind of problems do we want to solve? That's the priority. And then uh, whatever features or components you need to change to make that happen, that is the consequence of what you want to solve first. Okay, so you two... So in general, I think like having a, a sort of a very feature-centric approach is yeah. probably not the right way to go. Yeah. Um, it's sort of overlapping, the, the two, two things you said, and uh, let's, let's weave it back in the same direction and then get back to data for a moment. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why you might want to engineer things in a certain way is for compliance. But if we pause that one for just a moment and just focus on what engineers love to do, which is to do the coolest thing instead of the right thing, um, I think the strongest argument against that is exactly what Daniel said, which is that uh, uh, <clears throat> things are going to change and so it's not worth over-engineering it, right? But the, the stop from IT is going to be uh, tech debt. Mm. And I have my opinion on it, but what are your thoughts on tech debt when it comes to that kind of stuff? And, and I think part of being in that life is just finding what corners if you are actually cutting corners by not doing something, or, uh, and if you actually cut corners, knowing what corners to cut. Uh, and a lot of that comes from just thinking, what's the purpose? What, what are we here for? Well, if that is to supply a certain model with certain type of data, in some cases it's a monthly batch. Then you don't have to over-engineer and making sure that the the latency from arrival of data until it reaches the model is milliseconds, because you have a whole month. Right. Uh, and, and, in, and in other cases, I think that, I mean, it's like the CI/CD ha having that. If you're deploying two things a year, yeah, then that's definitely overcomplicating it. <clears throat> While at the same time, you have to think about. Okay, so we are a number of teams that deploy things regularly. We have to manage operations. We have to be able to, f to get things into production easily. Yeah, then you have to spend a lot of time on setting up the, 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 the supporting uh, infrastructure around it. Yeah. But you have to spend enough time. Yeah. So that it makes sense. But I mean, <coughs> the CI CD example is really nice because, you know, it would be, it would be plainly evident if companies actually sort of tracked the propagation of value backwards from projects. So, you know, imagine you're building an AI product that you only deploy twice a year, like you said, but you deploy it and it's delivering tremendous value. And you do need to do CI/CD eventually, but yeah. it's delivering value while you're, you know, uh, fixing the tech debt. Yeah. And I don't see that necessarily as a problem. Uh, and especially in light of what you said, uh, where you know maybe there's going to be another way of doing CI/CD in six months for specifically for LLMs or something like that, I, I do think that it seems very smart. What I call rapid prototyping, like yep. being able to build the MVP as quickly as possible, to, uh, so that you can start ticking the money counter and providing the values quickly as possible, uh, instead of having to wait six months to yep. see a drop of value. Yep. I just have a comment on that because I, I agree with it, but also I think that is one thing that I see in most organizations that doing that will create a certain degree of tech, tech depth. Yeah. You need, to have, uh, you need to have an empowerment of the engineering side of the teams to be able to pay that off. Because but somebody if, needs if, to keep track of the money in order to do that, right? Like uh, how much is this thing providing value? How much is this resource cost? Yeah, exactly, but I, I think that 
we need to trust our engineers to do that because they see and they understand it. If, if, you're, if you're a backlog slave, I mean, the business side will never order you. They will never ask you to prioritize to pay off technical debts. Right. I've never seen that happen. So the engineers need to decide, okay, we have taken these shortcuts. Yeah. Uh, we have proved value. Now we should invest and make it not, uh, not an MVP anymore, but actually a one but zero. Let me ask you a hypothetical. Uh, and by hypothetical, I mean it actually happens to me right now. Uh, what, you, what you think the right way to do it is. So we develop a, an assistant bot, and that assistant is able to replace X number of management consultants. You know management consultants are expensive. And so we designed it as a hack and slash duct tape. Here you go, have fun. Now the consultants are replaced. So the money's ticking up, but they're like, you didn't design logging the right way. You didn't design it according to our design principles. And I'm like, good, hire one guy full time, one year to fix my thing. It, you're still going to make more money. I, but there is no reporting to be able to do that kind of rationale. Mm. So where should that happen? Is it the engineers that should be leading that charge of sort of should there be an AI product manager? I mean, where does, where should, where does that end up, really? That's like a tricky question, I would say, but uh, if you look back like two or three, three years back, what was the biggest problem? Like, data science, data engineer, whole data science is going without aligning with software. And we have seen the, the side, like, it's going a bit chaotic because we don't have proper CI/CD or any of the engineering practices. Then we have learned that, yeah, this is a problem. So I don't think we should really repeat that. But just specifically to your question, yeah, probably on the example you were mentioning, I would say that, yeah, yeah, the board could really do the work and it could reduce like probably 10 management consultants. But have you tried the accuracy of the board? Are they going to give you the same answers always? How about, uh, how about if you, even if you bring one person, do you think that it will be good enough for that one person to validate all these things. Because validation is really a hard process. Sure, sure. So these are the questions probably I would like to put. For, again, I'm just yeah. more focused no, on quality. No, it might be more or less expensive in terms of the tech debt. I'm just wondering, because you know, it is true what you said, there's no business that's ever going to pay for hiring a tech guy to fix tech debt that the, some project introduced or something. But I'm asking, how do we think it should be? I'm, I'm, given, given this yeah. rapid prototyping that we know that it works and it's good, if it does introduce tech debt, do we, do we move just slow enough so we don't introduce too much tech debt, or do we charge ahead and provide as much value as we can and then maybe change some, some paradigms of how we manage these types of projects? But I, I, we have one take on that, and I think you, you should see it as, as, uh, as a product. Mm. Uh, I mean, you have some kind of, kind of business problem, get rid of management consultants. Yeah. Uh, you have an hypothesis that you can do it with, a, with an LLM. Mm. You do the problem exploration, you gather the data that you need, you train the model. Uh, then you probably validate, like, is this solution solving this problem? Mm. That's like one part of a product management process, but then, then you probably, when you have validated that hypothesis, you probably need to put it into production and manage it over some kind of arbitrary life cycle, right? Yeah. And I think dealing with it as a product and just seeing, like, can we improve, can we add new things, uh, can we make it more efficient, more, uh, have it costless? Mm. So I think managing it as a product and seeing that Validating an hypothesis and building an MVP is maybe just, okay, it's an MVP, minimum viable, but uh, we can probably make it a better round. Have you guys come across AI product managers at the places where you work? No. Have that? No. I, I mean, I, I really like the idea, and I think that it makes sense to have, a, have that role. I know there are data product managers, okay, but I just feel like this is very different than that. Yeah. I, th I think it's very, it, it varies between companies. I mean, uh, when, when I'm looking back to, like, my jobs at like Epidemic Sound or Spotify, then product, product was some center of everything. Right. Product managers were everywhere and they managed lifecycle also on data products uh, as well. Yeah. So I think it's more common there, but uh, the, on, on the enterprise side, there is still a bit of a divide between the business and IT being two separate things. I mean, that, for a tech company, that's not, that's not the thing. It's, there's yeah. no difference between IT right. and business because that's, we do tech It is tech your companies. business. Exactly. So I think that's a major thing, and I think there are a lot of learnings to be fed back from, uh, from across industries as well, and I wish it was more. But it's like retail, you know, uh, people, people, now we know that having a website doesn't make you an e-commerce company. No. An e-commerce company is through and through 
embedded with all these web principles uh, from your multi-channel strategy to everything else. Yep. And I think it's going to have to be the same thing with AI. It's not just going to be a gimmick. You're going to have to be an, uh, like embedded into your company culture somehow. Mm. Yes. Yeah, you go. Go uh, ahead. You, you I, 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 I have a, okay. So I think parts of it, uh, and I think working on it as a product, I mean, that's a, that's a, one, that's a model on how to handle it. And I think one, the important part around it is to have, first of all, the transparency. What are you getting? And, and, and being a good communicator in what are you actually getting? So it has all of these features that functionally solves what we want to solve. But if you want it to run 24 seven and you want it to be restartable and you want to have all of these and these and these, that will affect how many people you have to have to maintain it, mm. then, we're, then we have these very basic features, but not all of this that could be there. Right. Being transparent and, and uh, working hard on that communication, I think, helps a lot. That is a perfect segue to a word here that I want to hear uh, a little bit about from all of you, which is scalability. Um, a lot of people think that scalability is the ability to you know, spin up more container instances. But to me, scalability is you have your team of 10 people and now they're not supposed to be doing two experiments, they're supposed to be doing 200 experiments. Uh, how, how do you achieve that level of scalability? <coughs> Lele here said yesterday uh, that uh, you know, th these good teams are not like two times more effective, they're like 2,000 times more effective. Yeah. What is the secret ingredient? Scalability, it's, it's, it's something probably we have to reflect. Just extending this compute power is one thing, hmm. but how can we do it in a cost-effective way, more sustainable way, is also something we have to reflect on. Because just increasing the computing power or storage is just in enough, because we, at the end of the day, we have to look at the financial KPI as well, because this is going to be really costly stuff. But like the, the team, how do you get a team of seven people to perform like a team of 70 people? Yeah, that's very like, I'm at yeah, this financial yeah. institution that has so many technical resources. Yep. So many of them. But it's really just a few people that are doing like a lot of the work <laughs> when yeah, it comes to yeah. AI stuff at least. Probably that's where we I think like probably Jenai can help some of these areas. For example, how can we do some of the things that were doing done by technical experts? For example, uh -huh. classification of data. Yeah. That's one example. This is now it can be done by AI. Yeah. Or uh, uh, another example would be maybe like uh, just uh, encrypting some of the PII data. That also even some of the AI can do that. So how can we make sure that some of the labor intensive work that was doing pre before could be automated or could be done through AI? That's you know the ultimate Unix uh, insult is to say that I can replace you with a shell script. But I guess this is, this is the modern version with an LLM. <laughs> <It's> the LLM. <laughs> now what do you think about uh, efficiency and scalability of, of the team, I, I'd say? And several parts around it and you have to iterate to really get there but i think point. That, uh, but i think that one part is prioritization mm. and actually focus if you are a team of two mm. instead of two teams of 10 yeah then i mean there are so many so much fewer things you can actually do you have to focus on what to really get to the target and maybe you're not doing a lot of unnecessary business requirement documents and, and a lot of unnecessary drawings that no one actually looks at and, and following tons of process 